did my medical college in, uh, in Pakistan. And then um, I moved to the US for postgraduate training and um, stayed there for about a decade uh, doing clinical practice. And then I've been here for a few years now at the university where my main uh, job is actually teaching medical students. And uh, I enjoy doing uh, some of these uh, uh, workshops for graduate students um, in which uh, you know, I can teach at a higher level. So it's always a pleasure uh, meeting you guys and talking to you and uh, uh, you know, looking at things from a higher perspective of a graduate student at master's or doctorate level. So these are some of the learning objectives of our workshop and uh, some resources um, that uh, I'll be going over with you uh, in case you didn't get a chance to review them before that. So this is uh, my outline for today's uh, workshop. Uh, I've divided the presentation into four parts. Uh, part one is uh, causes of project failure. Part two are some research tips that I've learned along the way uh, in my own research studies. And part three are project management tools uh, that will keep you on track, uh, some new tools as well as some traditional project management stuff. And then finally, we'll end with the uh, human factors in research project. As you know, it's not just about the right tools, it's also about how you relate to your fellow team members, how you communicate, uh, that will keep your project on track. So a startling statistic, you know, 65 to 80 percent of IT projects, and this refers to, of course, uh, software development projects, um, fail to meet their objectives. And I think actually the number is probably higher. Um, it, um, you know, it reflects the difficulty and complexity of uh, completing projects. Uh, even well-defined projects. And uh, there's always uh, issues, problems, challenges that are not foreseen. And it's, uh, it, you know, it, it is um, not easy. And that's why there's a whole field of project management uh, that has come up to help with project planning and uh, keeping projects on track, whether you're making a new software program or you're um, uh, making a new airport, um, all these are considered projects. Each project has multiple steps um, and uh, they have to be managed uh, in terms of time, uh, resources, funding, uh, to be able to deliver a tangible project at the end of the project. So there is um, what each project should have what is called a tangible outcome uh, or a deliverable. Um, so, you know, projects can fail for multiple reasons, and we'll delve a little bit into that. Uh, let me share you one project that failed uh, that I was working with. Um, this project was a study of, uh, on patients with diabetes, and we were trying to study uh, why patients on diabetes are not switching to insulin, uh, despite being uh, required to do so. So we interviewed a lot of, uh, we actually looked at a lot of uh, medical records of patients with diabetes, and we tried to see which uh, patients were on insulin, which were not on insulin. And then, um, you know, when we came down to analysis after doing all our data collection, we found that we had not recorded certain important variables like patient's age or gender. So those are critical variables. And uh, the entire study was scrapped because we could not go back and re um, collect all that detailed data. Uh, so, you know, it, it just, there was just a little bit of lack of planning uh, in terms of some critical elements. And the entire effort came to waste. Uh, we could not publish the study. Uh, it was a good study and uh, a lot of effort, a lot of work uh, that we could not produce any results. Um, so let me open this to you guys now. Uh, why do you think research projects fail? And um, I'd love to hear your feedback uh, before I share mine. Um, so any ideas, any thoughts, uh, you can type in the message box or the chat box. Um, I, can, I have that visible on my screen. So why do you think research projects fail, um, especially like in graduate level? Or why, what are the challenges that you face when you're doing your projects? 
So anything that you have uh, experienced or personally seen that is causing delays or problems in, in your thesis or data collection, uh, feel free to share in the chat box. So. Uh, anything that, um, yeah, so we have one, you know, finds availability for chemicals analysis. Uh, uh, yeah, wrong hypothesis, uh, very good. So you're starting with the wrong uh, hypothesis. You're most likely this is probably not, uh, you know, well, the literature review was not done. Time management, excellent, we'll touch base on that. Not having enough knowledge and information, uh, very good. Uh, poor research questions, same as the wrong hypothesis, lack of teamwork. Um, poor planning, not making a schedule and keeping up with tasks. Very good, Angela. Um, lack of planning, yes, very good. If you plan, if you fail to plan, you, you plan to fail. And the insufficient funding. Uh, funding is always a problem. Uh, it's not just to you guys, it's also with uh, faculty. Um, so, and this will remain a problem, uh, you know, because of so many research projects. Uh, undefined questions and objectives and a lack of knowledge of the problems in gap and field. Very good. So excellent, Donna. You, it, it shows that, you know, if, if you don't do your literature review, uh, if you don't have good questions and clear objectives, uh, it, you know, your project is going to have problems. Unclear scope, that's a, a well-written summary. Uh, boundaries not defined. So yeah, the scope is not defined. You're doing everything. You're trying to do everything and uh, you end up doing nothing. Uh, animal model issues, yeah. So you know you're um, uh, getting the animals, and then if, if the experiments don't pan out, uh, uh, that's that's tough. So I think you've got a good uh, handle on some of the basic issues. Some of what I have heard from graduate students is you know lack of time, uh, other courses, exams. Um, and uh, lack of resources, some of you touched base on it. But uh, some of the higher level issues, I think that you have also, some of you have mentioned, uh, include uh, uh, no written plan uh, with each step clearly defined. Um, no target dates. Uh, no scheduled daily meetings, uh, no daily focus. Uh, too many emails. I don't know if any of you are suffering from that. Uh, and no single project board. So uh, some of these are, you know, things that we will touch base uh, in this workshop. And so stay tuned. Um, some of, uh, I tried to focus a little bit uh, more sharply on uh, causes of research failure. And in my personal experience, you know, it, it uh, boils down to not giving priority to the study. There's so many other priorities and needs and you know, demands on your time. Uh, not writing a research notebook so you don't have a journal and then not reading extensively, which you know, comes back to having undefined questions and objectives or lack of knowledge of the problems and gaps in the selected field. So, um, I would boil it down to these three, but um, of course, each uh, field has slightly different issues. So let's compare two approaches to project management. Um, uh, you know, one you could say is an informal approach, and uh, one would be a proper project management approach. Um, so an informal approach, you know, you learn as you go, you try to do the best you can. Uh, you write a lot of emails, you ask for help when needed, uh, you talk to other students what they're doing. Uh, so kind of rely on your uh, common sense or gut feeling to get things done. Uh, in contrast, you know, project management, you try to learn project management techniques and tools. Uh, you use them, you apply them in your project, uh, you avoid the pitfalls, um, implement best practices uh, in project management. Um, so, you know, you have to see, um, I'm not going to sell you on one or the other, but uh, you have to make a judgment on what, what you feel is better or what you feel is more likely to succeed. 
sometimes uh, we see students, uh, you know, uh, thinking of projects, the research project or thesis requirement is just a course requirement. You know, uh, I just want to finish my degree. I'm not interested in research as a career. Or I'll just do a minimum project to get the requirements done. Um, that, of course, is not a very positive attitude. Uh, it, it will drag you down. Um, even if, if you are feeling these things, it's better not to say it out loud. You know, don't, don't to share these feelings. Uh, don't, uh, you know, uh, bring other students down. Um, is there a better way to do this? Um, yes. You know, you, you can have what's called the winning attitude. Uh, in which you know you you say to yourself, I want to learn. I want to make the best use of my time. Uh, I want to do more. Uh, I will gain new skills. So you are here in college. You are here at the university. Uh, it's best to make the best use of your time. Uh, and you know you you can do anything. You know you can make the best study. Uh, you can complete your project on time. Uh, um, as long as you have the right attitude. So that's the first step in project management is to have that right winning attitude. So put it more concretely, uh, we I put like a contrasting tale of two students, Shahid and Kamran. Um, Shahid has a casual approach to projects, uh, no written diary, no project plan, spends more time on email, uh, just trying to graduate and get the project done quickly. Uh, the other student, Kamran, has developed a detailed project plan, uh, works on his research project every day, keeps a written project notebook, and then posts his progress on the project website. So, you know, the entire team can see the progress and uh, comment and provide feedback. So, you know, again, you want, uh, to have an approach that is more likely to succeed. Um, this is something I found uh, on uh, researching for this presentation. So common research pitfalls, uh, uh, not establishing a focused answerable question. So again, you know, we, uh, the hypothesis, you have to have the right uh, research question, a clear um, question that you aim to answer with your experiment. Um, having a research supervisor who is already busy is not helpful. Picking a topic in which you have little interest just because, uh, you know, the supervisor said it or that's where the funding was. Uh, planning a small complicated study that answers too many questions, a scope issue. Uh, not taking time to draft a research outline. Uh, not being realistic about how much time and effort your project requires, so being uh, over ambitious. Uh, this is more to do with medicine, but basing a prospective study on outcomes that are rare or take a long time to occur. Um, entering data using incorrect formats. Um, and uh, not meeting a statistician or a research methodologist to talk about the analysis before you begin collecting the data. And then finally, waiting too long to begin. Um, don't uh, don't wait, or don't keep uh, delaying uh, something you know you want to start uh, working on as soon as possible. So, uh, in terms of getting a good research question or a good research project, you have to be creative. You have to think outside the box. You know, do some lateral thinking. Um, and so what's the basis of creativity? Here are some general approaches, a general approach to creativity. Uh, believe and commit to being more creative. So you, you think of yourself as a creative individual, as an artist. Uh, know that creativity and intelligence are dynamic and can be increased through training, through reading, uh, to talking to people. Uh, have an ongoing and broad exposure to other ideas and areas. So reading, um, uh, join, uh, uh, listening to conferences and talks. Uh, don't be quick to judge ideas as good or bad. Uh, examine the value and seek to improve them. Uh, develop a habit to vary, so change things around. Uh, if you're going to a restaurant, try a different dish. Don't, don't just stick to the same dish every time. 
uh, find or redefine the problem. Um, so if you um, have uh, you know a, a challenge, uh, try to redefine it in your own terms as instead of what is given to you as a challenge. Uh, develop multiple answers to any problem, maybe at least 10 answers to one uh, challenge. So look at each problem from multiple angles and develop multiple solutions uh, to the problem. Uh, try sharing and joining ideas with their, others, uh, discuss your ideas and uh, um, see what they think and then you know, combine ideas with others. Uh, seek challenges for our ideas and persist. So if your idea, uh, uh, don't just think of your idea being accepted right away. Uh, ask people what they think is the problem with your idea and then persist in trying to solve it. And then allow yourself time and purposely daydream, think, um, you know, just uh, don't uh, have some time in your schedule or days in which you will not work on anything, but just, you know, think about things. So techniques for idea generation. Um, um, so if, if you have, and this is very broad. Uh, so if you have something, you try to adapt it to other uses and apply it elsewhere, not where it is normally used. Modify the color, sound, shape, or meaning. Uh, magnify it, increase it, uh, increase it in size. Minify it or small it and make it smaller. Uh, remove something from it, uh, make it shorter, lighter. Uh, substitute with different materials, processes, locations, or personnel. Uh, rearrange, swap components, alert, uh, alter the pattern, sequence, or layout, change the pace or the schedule, uh, swap the cause and effect. Uh, then uh, reverse that process, do the opposite, go backwards, uh, swap in the opposite direction. Um, so, you know, uh, for example, you know, um, if you're not, if you're trying to develop a new teaching technique uh, to school children, uh, you're not satisfied with basic lectures. Maybe you want to modify it, uh, adapt it, uh, change, combine it with other things, other activities. Um, so those are ways you can be creative and be problem solving. And then combine units, purposes, or ideas again. So you have uh, combined things from different things. Uh, different uh, disciplines, uh, different fields. An important part is doing your a good uh, background reading. Uh, so read extensively. I would recommend printing out your paper, uh, double-sided of course, and then uh, uh, reading, annotating it, uh, making notes on them. Um, you know, you could go to a nice cafe with your stack of papers and read them carefully, um, especially read the methods section. Um, and uh, those are sections that uh, other people don't read. Um, read the end of discussion for usually that has ideas for further research. So read extensively, uh, otherwise, you know, you may again end up with issues of scope and uh, inappropriate hypotheses. Some people collect a set of interesting research articles in a paper in a file folder. And I've seen a lot of professors do that. Uh, even if you're going to throw them away at the end of the project, it's nice to have a collection of printed uh, articles. Um, look at some checklists for research in your field. Uh, this is the Equator Network for um, um, research in uh, healthcare. Uh, anyone from the College of Medicine or Health Sciences uh, in the students uh, today? Um, so for people who are in the health sciences, this is a good website that provides guidelines for research studies. And um, so I see, yeah, a uh, few people here. Thanks for coming. Um, so for, for people in health sciences, you know, you have, uh, um, you have a lot of checklists. So these are one or two page checklists 
uh, that will help you to make sure that your study does not miss an important point. And uh, oftentimes in the peer review stage, when you've completed the study, written the manuscript and sent it to a journal, the peer reviewer will say, uh, did you do this? And uh, if you don't have a good checklist, then you're likely to miss something. So look for a good checklist, research checklist in your field and make sure you print it out and follow it to the letter. Um, if you cannot do one thing, then uh, don't ignore it. Uh, write it in your method section why you did not do that and what steps you took to reduce the bias um, because of that. Uh, make sure you collect uh, all the important variables in your study. So you must have a good outcome variable, which is the result of your study. Um, you should have one primary outcome and maybe two or three secondary outcomes. Um, you should have multiple predictor variables, uh, including age, gender, which are called confounding variables or covariates. It's better to be on the safer side and collect more variables, but don't go overboard. I've seen, you know, uh, questionnaires that are more than 10 pages long. It becomes challenging for data collection and it's uh, tedious for the patients or the respondents. Uh, avoid grouping variables when you're collecting data. So if for eight, you should record the actual age in years rather than one to 10 or 11 to 20. Uh, the only exception is that, you know, personally identifiable, uh, personally sensitive uh, information such as income. People are reluctant to give you the exact value. So you, you may be uh, forced to use ranges in that situation. How many variables, um, uh, you know, to collect, um, you should, as I mentioned, you should have your outcome variables, primary and secondary predictor variables, including established predictors and new predictors that you are trying to research, uh, confounding variables, um, Remember that your sample size should be at least 10 times more than the number of variables. So if your questionnaire has, uh, say, um, uh, 17 variables, then your sample size should be at least 170. Uh, this is just a rough uh, rule of thumb. You should use a more um, sophisticated sample size calculator. Uh, but in general, uh, you want a sample size that is at least 10 times more than the number of variables in your study. Here's a research study that um, I conducted um, and um, alhamdulillah last week, uh, the paper was accepted in the journal after three round, rounds of uh, peer review. Uh, but again, you can see how to collect your data so that it is coded nicely. Uh, there is some guidance for the data collector. Yeah, I think we, uh, we can use statistics to calculate the required sample size in terms of your estimates of your uh, previous uh, studies and then what you're trying to measure. So just search online for sample size calculator um, or we can do a separate workshop on that uh, if, if you think that would be useful. Data entry from paper forms to Excel. So try to collect your data on paper forms. I would, I would recommend that instead of directly on your Excel. Uh, there is some safety in paper forms in terms of, uh, you know, you're, you have a hard copy. Um, but when you're entering from paper forms to Excel, make sure uh, you don't make, do any errors in data entry. So don't use the mouse, use the tab keys to move around. Zoom in the Excel as much as possible to make the text bigger. Uh, you can enable speak cells on enter in Excel so if the computer speaks out what you enter and use data validation. So in Excel, you can, there is a column for uh, command for data validation. So you can um, limit what you can enter into a column. So for example, uh, in um, age, you can limit from certain age, like 20 to 100, um, so that there is no errors in uh, data entry. And then uh, don't discard your paper forms. Um, number each form and enter the form number into your Excel spreadsheet. 
Another tip is to start writing the manuscript uh, before uh, even you start the data collection. So don't wait until you have completed data collection. This is helpful because then uh, when you're writing the introduction and the methods and even maybe parts of discussion or the abstract, you can, um, you, it, things will come out at you that uh, things that you need to do in, in terms of your data collection. If you start writing after you have uh, completed your study and completed all your data collection, it is difficult to go back and uh, do more data collection. Um, and those things just come to you when, uh, when you start writing. Um, try to look for articles on statistical errors in your field. So um, instead of you know trying to look at what uh, are the possible uh, statistics you can do, also look for uh, search online for any articles on statistical errors in your research field. And then uh, read that article carefully and avoid those errors when you're writing your article. So these uh, articles often they review like last 10 years of research and point out what are the common errors and it's a very good tip uh, to help you uh, streamline and avoid some of the common errors uh, and it will make your thesis or article more professional uh, label your lab specimens and data collection forms carefully so use a consistent name format uh, for your specimens and that matches what is in your computer files. So here is an example of you know, naming your file and then naming the sample or the notebook um, or the data form or the questionnaire form. So both should try to match as much as possible. Um, so you can refer um, back uh, in both directions. Um, so a lot of people, you know, they skip the note writing. Um, they want to just enter directly into the computer or in Excel. Um, that's not a good habit. Sometimes, you know, you, you can have data entry errors when you're and when you're analyzing. You want to refer back to a hard copy. Um, so get into the habit of recording in a notebook, um, uh, maybe your research notebook. And all your entries should be dated and timed uh, and with neat handwriting. One thing I found useful is the Brother uh, label printer. So keep a label printer with you so you can you know, print out labels on your specimens or um, and some research uh, items. Uh, make it easy to read and uh, access. And again, use the right uh, same um, labels as you use in your uh, computer files. Um, I have a system for naming your files and folders on your computer. So I just want to share it with you. Again, it helps with your project management. Uh, for folders, I recommend using uh, very short one to two word folder names. Uh, each folder should contain either subfolders or files, but not a mix of both. So uh, when you look in a folder, it should either have only files or only subfolders. A folder should not have more than 12 subfolders or files. Uh, if, you're, if you're having too many files in one folder, you should reorganize with the files, either create new subfolders and then move them into those subfolders. Uh, for files, I recommend using uh, file names that are long and descriptive. Uh, for example, research proposal version one, dated 30 August 2021, diabetes study. So, you know, you have um, a long file name. Uh, you can use spaces in your file name. Um, you don't have to use underscores. Uh, and uh, I remember the days when uh, 
the file names were restricted in earlier one, uh, versions of Windows to just uh, eight characters and it would be very difficult to get a good file name that is descriptive. Uh, should include a version number using two digits, uh, so 0, 1, 0, 2, that way you can sort uh, by file name um, and uh, then you can uh, see how your uh, look at previous versions of your document. So first we should describe the content. So for example, manuscript or data or presentation. Um, uh, this is called tagging and it is part of knowledge management and I'll touch base on that in the later slide. And then append some notes in the file name. So you, you can be a little bit descriptive. So uh, it will help you when you're looking at the file names, uh, what you did in that file, instead of just uh, opening the file and then relying on your memory. Uh, things to avoid, uh, using the word final, uh, there's never a final version, um, so you can instead use terms such as submission file and storing all your files on the desktop or all in one folder. It creates a lot of files. It's difficult to look at and actually is, uh, causes stress. Uh, you can rely on search, uh, but even that uh, doesn't work all the time um, uh, unless you have good file names. Um, um, but I think it's worth the time to organize your folders so you know you can uh, locate your files easily without relying on search. So some examples. Um, there's an example of uh, Windows Explorer showing some uh, the the root document folder um, or the root folder. Um, what what is the problem with this? What what do you think is uh, not an optimal thing in this? Yes, thank you. Very good. That one uh, files and folders are together, so it's a mixture of folders and files, and uh, that is cognitively um, overloading. So you're you don't want that. It, it creates stress and it's difficult to look at. So this is a more neat uh, organization of the documents folder. Um, you have six folders. Each is just one or two words. It's easy to scan. Um, they can have a lot of subfolders inside them, but uh, at the main level, you know, it's, it's not stressful. You know which, which folder contains what. And then say, for example, your research folder can have another set of subfolders. Here there are about seven subfolders in the research folder. And again, just each folder is one or two words and it's neatly organized. Um, you don't have to try to think what is inside this folder. Just looking at the label. Uh, um, yeah, good comment, uh, Yusuf, about backup. Uh, I think that's an excellent, um, um, also, you, you already had an experience with ransomware virus. That, uh, plus, also remember that computers can crash, um, the hard disks can crash, and uh, everything can become inaccessible. Uh, we had one faculty member whose uh, computer just crashed completely. He could not access his files, and then he actually thought of uh, retiring. And he said, just, it's impossible to continue. So make sure you make a backup, uh, store some of your files in the cloud um, on a regular basis. Uh, so file names, um, some examples of five good file names. Um, this is a thesis file name. So see how long the file name is. And uh, it includes a version number, the date. Even though Windows does a date stamp, I prefer to have the date in the file name. Um, and then some comments at the end of the file name. And then maybe a, a, a future version of the same file, um, you have added data tables and graphs. Uh, here's an Excel file. Uh, even though it's an Excel file, I want to use the keyword or the tag data as the first word, and then um, add some uh, comments uh, if this, this is the initial study data. 
Uh, similarly, for PowerPoint files, I have the word presentation as the first word, uh, version number, date, and, and a descriptive uh, title. Notice that there is no final uh, in this uh, in the findings. Okay, uh, time for a break. Uh, we'll um, do a mini vacation. It's hard to travel right now due to COVID. So we'll do a virtual vacation. This is actually a conference that I went to in Langkawi in Malaysia. Um, has anyone been to Langkawi? Um, so it's just a visual break. Um, so let's, uh, it's about like a seven hour flight there. I think there are a couple of daily flights by Emirates directly to Langkawi. Um, so you get to stay at a nice resort by the beach. Uh, this is all uh, paid by the university uh, being a conference. Uh, so a nice perk being in an academic job. Uh, this wasn't there when I was a full-time clinician. Uh, Langkawi is famous for its um, uh, cable ride. This is a cable car that goes up a steep mountain and you get a nice view of the island. Oh, okay, somebody's from Malaysia. And uh, you, get, uh, you can do a river cruise where you can see some fish eagles swooping down with uh, some amazing uh, acrobatics uh, to pick fish from the river. And um, at nighttime, they take you through the river and you can see a lot of fireflies. So the fireflies are growing. And what's amazing is they are all uh, flashing in a synchronized way. So in one tree, uh, you will see thousands of fireflies and they're turning on and off their lights in a synchronized, uh, all of them simultaneously on and off. It's an amazing experience. And you can ride your bike around the island. And of course, there's always uh, beautiful sunsets to see. So hopefully uh, COVID will be over soon and then uh, we can have uh, uh, back to our normal conference schedule. Um, all right, uh, back to project management. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to share some project management tools. These are uh, somewhat traditional tools, and then I'll show you some new developments in project management. Uh, probably the most famous tool in project management is the Gantt chart, and I'm sure you've seen some version of it um, in your careers. Uh, try to make a Gantt chart for your project uh, and um, you know, make it as detailed as possible. Um, you don't have to put the exact dates, some proximate dates with the shading. Uh, notice that they have put uh, gray shading for milestones and red shading for deliverables. So red shading is, you know, poster presentation and then another presentation at grand rounds. So those are fixed dates usually and uh, you want to have a deliverable ready by then. Um, so each, uh, you know, each um, period is uh, as a range of dates that you can, you know, you start work on and end on, and there's some overlap also. Um, notice that there is uh, what's called the work breakdown structure, WBS, and I'll be talking about that a little bit uh, um, in a minute uh, about uh, what's called the work breakdown structure. So even if you have a Gantt chart and you know what you're doing when, you still have to be flexible in your timings. Um, uh, you should um, be mentally ready to stay late till seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock if needed. It should not be a regular occurrence. And uh, you may need to work overnight occasionally. I've done that. Um, it's not pleasant, uh, but it's, you know, it's doable. Uh, sometimes you just need to do that to get things done. Um, once you're past two, two in the morning, uh, you can stay away. Otherwise, you know, just uh, grab some coffee or wash your face or make wudu, uh, and then you will be refreshed and continue working. But sometimes you have to do those marathons to just get your project through. Um, even, even if you have a nice Gantt chart or everything, you still need to push your project 
uh, in a way, you are the engine. Uh, you are the train engine for the project. Everybody is relying on you. Uh, you have to pull it, uh, push it, uh, do the work, get it done. Uh, don't leave it to the date of the deadline. Um, that is stressful. Um, if you have a deliverable deadline, say a presentation or thesis submission, uh, don't leave it uh, for that day. Um, it's not only stressful, but it will also cause you to produce low quality work. You will not be able to reach your full potential. Uh, even if you have time on the day of the deadline, um, there is a underlying stress and pressure on you. And you know, that tension, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, produce your best work. It will keep you moving, but it's not uh, something pleasant. A better option is to think of the deadline as one day before the deadline. That's what I tell my children. Um, so if the deadline is the 10th, um, think of the deadline as being on the 9th. And uh, on the 9th, you want to just finish the project no matter what. Uh, even if you have to stay late or stay uh, stay awake overnight. Um, this way you will be less stressed and you can do a higher quality work. You can reach your potential. Um, just the feeling is different. Just one day before the deadline, your concentration is better. You're relaxed. You can do more work. On the day of deadline, it's, it's stressful, tension filled, and um, the quality of work goes down. Um, here is a fancy term for a flow chart, um, the high level process map. So make sure you make a high level process map for your study, uh, for your research project. Um, it's, just, it's just a flow chart. Um, if you call it a high level process map, you will sound better in terms of project management. And then a one page summary is called a project charter. So it's a one page summary with uh, these kind of bullet points and uh, uh, milestones and team members. Um, it's just a, a quick overview, uh, but it contains all the essential uh, data points for your project. Uh, so make sure you make a project charter, that's just one page printable page uh, that contains all the essential um, uh, information about your research project. And then uh, what's called a work breakdown structure, which is just, you know, just breaking down your project into steps, the detailed steps, uh, different phases, and in each phase, multiple activities or steps. So it's again, it's like an organization chart, um, but uh, with a technical name of work breakdown structure. It's a favorite among project management specialists. Uh, and if you do include it in your grant proposal or your uh, research proposal, you know, you, it looks very nice and professional. And here's an example of a work breakdown structure. Uh, nothing very fancy, but uh, essential. Uh, the more detailed and the, the more steps you can make, uh, the better. And then each of these uh, steps will then, uh, you can move it to your Gantt chart. Um, another tip I want to share with you is that keep things uh, in the same place uh, on your desk, in your lab, in your office, uh, so that you can even find them in the dark. Um, uh, you know, if, if you have a desk, make sure you keep your notebook, your pens in the same place every day. Uh, keep a pencil and some colored pens uh, accessible. Um, don't move things around. Um, this, of course, applies even more to your car keys and your wallet and your smartphone. Always keep them in the same place. Uh, and even if there is uh, uh, darkness, you should still be able to find it uh, blindly. So that's just a habit of being disciplined and uh, keeping things consistent.
Okay, so some of the problems that, that are caused by emails in project management, um, you can have uh, confusion due to lengthy emails, uh, bad feelings due to miscommunication in email, uh, stress due to high volume of emails and frequent checking, and delay in project completion due to misunderstanding. So uh, a lot of these misunderstandings, miscommunication, confusion are caused by email. And I'm sure you have experienced it. Um, already email is now considered uh, uh, old technology and uh, possibly obsolete in terms of project management. Uh, don't, um, in your first job, uh, talk about using email in your uh, project management. Um, it's pretty much well known now and uh, that's a lot of alternative tools uh, to email. And I'm going to show you some, uh, but let me just tell you some quick um, uh, solutions that you could try to prevent some of these problems is write brief emails, uh, avoid discussing angry feelings via email, uh, send fewer emails and limit your email checking. So don't check email all the day. Uh, maybe just maybe like three times a day or twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Uh, that should be sufficient. Uh, don't send email uh, after hours or at night. Uh, even if you've written the email, just save it as draft and send it in the morning. Um, have face-to-face -face discussions uh, with your supervisor instead of email, share online cloud files. Instead of email attachments, uh, use a Kanban board. Uh, what's a Kanban board? Okay, it's, uh, it's a project management tool that was developed at uh, Toyota Corporation, a car manufacturer. Um, and it has uh, really revolutionized uh, project management and uh, introduced what's called lean manufacturing or just in time. Uh, so in that, you know, you get a visual overview of uh, what needs to be done, what you're currently doing, and what has been completed or done. So you have three columns, and in each column, you can put in some sticky notes or some, you know, uh, to-do lists uh, about what uh, has to be done, what you're currently doing, and what has been already completed. So as each task is done, it is moved from left to right until it reaches the rightmost column. Here's an example of a real Kanban board. Uh, you can see it can become pretty busy, but still it's a nice one place visual overview of everything that needs to be done uh, or is being done and what has been completed. Uh, so it would be nice to have this for your research project um, you can see what are the challenges, what things are in the backlog, uh, what needs review and clearance. So one popular um, example of an online Kanban board is Trello uh, or Trello.com. Um, so you can use a Kanban board uh, with paper and uh, a notice board on the wall. I think that works fine for most people and I would actually recommend that. Um, if you enjoy working on online and like to share things online and your supervisor is uh, good with that, then try Trello. Uh, Trello is a very popular project management software uh, website uh, that allows you to develop Kanban boards that you can share with your team members, they can edit it, they can comment on it. Um, and then you know, everybody has one central point at which they can share what's the progress or the current status of the uh, project. Yes, it is free and it's free uh, to use. There are of course some premium features you can use. Uh, so, but I think for, for most part for a, a research project, it is free to use actually you can uh, email them and they will give you the full version for free if you tell them you are a university student. So as you can see, you have on the left side, you have the um, um, project plan, which is your to-do list. And you have put in these cards under this list. 
And then you can move a card to the currently doing, and then you can move the card uh, to done when you have completed it. So for example, here, the literature review has been completed. So it is now moved to the done uh, list. So for example, if you are working on the ethics application, you would move that card from the to-do list to the currently doing list. And so anyone who looks at the Kanban board online on Trello can tell you know, what you're currently working on. You're writing the research uh, ethics application and you've already done the literature review. And they can also see what is your plan for the next, uh, and you even have a, a deadline for the grant application, which is September 1, and that is also visible uh, on the Kanban board. So let me show you a live demo of the Kanban board. Okay, so here is um, Trello.com and uh, I've logged in and created this graduate research project board. Um, and um, I can move in, I say I've completed the literature review. So I just click on it and drag it to the done um, list. So this is what is called a card and moving the card from the to-do list to the done list. And if I'm writing the research application, I will just move it to the currently doing uh, list. Uh, once I'm done writing the research application, I will just move it to the done and then uh, add um, uh, what I'm working on next, which is currently doing. So uh, you can annotate each one by, if you hover your mouse on it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Asma, if you're working on multiple projects, you can create multiple boards. So, you know, you, uh, you can click on this board button and then add a new board. So, and you can share each board with specific people. So you're, uh, uh, say if you're working on one project with one supervisor and another project with a different supervisor, then you can share each board to the different supervisors and different people on the team. And uh, they can also annotate and comment. So uh, let me show you, if you hover your mouse on a particular card and click on this pencil icon, um, it shows you, you can do different things on it. Um, you know, you can uh, edit uh, the labels on it. You can you know, color code your labels. Uh, you know, you can write, uh, you know, uh, uh, urgent and then, uh, you know, apply that label on it. Uh, you can also, um, uh, you know, um, add some automation to it. Um, uh, when you're done, you can cre uh, create a to-do list in a card. Um, you can change the color uh, and all sorts of things. So, you know, you're um, add some uh, nice photographs um, to your card. And again, that you don't want to make it too busy, uh, otherwise it becomes distracting. Um, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a good tool uh, if you're into online collaboration and your research supervisor or your team um, it, it does check it. The, the key thing is that they should also be checking on it on a regular basis. Otherwise, uh, people tend to fall back onto email. Uh, but for most uh, progressive teams, uh, especially in software development, uh, using online collaboration is now a requirement. It's not an option. 
and uh, relying on email is considered bad practice. So just some overall view about the drive in the project management towards the data-driven approach. Um, uh, an informal approach to project management is, you know, I, I can remember the steps. I just have one project. It's all in my head. Um, I have better things to do than writing in a notebook. Uh, these are considered uh, unprofessional now. We want to, especially in a collaborative project, be sharing uh, your knowledge and information for team success. So key elements in data-driven approach is to measure and write down, write detailed records, complete the date and time. Um, and you know, you can just have good records uh, that show what you're doing, what you're planning to do. Um, so if you have your Gantt chart and you do uh, your project uh, work breakdown structure. You need to have a daily to-do list. Uh, you, you want what, what are you going to do today? Um, and I'm, I'll show you some tips on uh, structuring your to-do list. Uh, first thing is don't keep it all in your head. Um, that's a waste of your uh, valuable cognitive space. Uh, you want to use your head to think creatively, to look for ideas. You don't want to put um, um things uh that you know can be put on a, on a sheet of paper so always write down your to-do list uh, don't write on pieces of paper or scraps you should have a notebook um, and uh, as you move across uh, different uh, semesters or months uh, move to the next page in the notebook to write your to-do list uh, this is your most important productivity tool, so uh, pay attention to it. You should review it on a daily basis. Um, you should review your to-do list before checking email in the morning. Um, I think this is the most important tip. If there's one thing that uh, uh, you can remember from this presentation, uh, this should be it. Uh, check your uh, to-do list before checking email. Because email will define uh, what other people want you to do. You want to be self-driven. Uh, you want to set your own agenda. And you don't want to be reacting to other people's priorities. Um, your thesis research project is your most important priority. Uh, answering email is not. Um, don't throw away your to-do list, file them or archive them in uh, somewhere uh, in case you want to refer to them. Um, you don't have to keep it on your desk, but um, uh, keep, keep a record. So should you use a paper or an app when you're using your to-do list? Um, let me, um, okay, somebody said both, uh, excellent. Um, I was planning to use uh, uh, a poll, but I can't access it for some reason. Um, so the answer, yeah, I would say both too. Um, uh, my personal preference is for paper because it allows me to annotate and you know you can use uh, different colors uh, you can um, add notes in the margin um, so it is always on uh, there's no risk of crashing uh, but with an app uh, you can share it uh, you can access it on the go if you're working in the lab and in an office um, you can access it at both places so I think, yeah, that's uh, Yusuf, you got it uh, perfectly, you should use both. And uh, let me add, you should also post a copy behind a door. And uh, I like to post it 
behind my wardrobe, the clothes wardrobe door. Uh, but any door that, you know, is uh, hidden from others, but visible to you frequently. So um, you should have three copies of your to-do list, uh, a paper notebook, the smartphone app, and behind the door. And the smartphone app should ideally synchronize with your desktop calendar. So it's not essential, but um, it's nice to have. So if you're using Outlook, um, with the Microsoft to-do list, you can synchronize it. So you, if you download the Microsoft Outlook app on your Android phone, you can get your reminders on your phone uh, while you're using a paper notebook as well as behind the door. And uh, behind the door, you can you know post it. You can use a Kanban board and use sticky notes. Uh, something you know whenever you're. Um, you know, changing your clothes in the morning, you can have a quick look at it. Um, so it is something visible, even if you don't look at your notebook or your smartphone. So it is so important that I think it's worth doing the three copies. Um, they don't have to be perfectly in sync, but um, uh, at least synchronize once a month. How to write your to-do list? Um, write each task in detail. So start with a word such as write, email, call, talk to. Uh, specify what the exact work is in each in detail. Uh, draw a um, small checkbox and then color it when it's done. Don't cross out uh, the item or don't put a tick mark. Rather, um, color the box when it's done makes more satisfying. Uh, structure your to-do list page. Um, so divide the page into regions. So you don't have one to-do list, but rather you have like uh, different areas of the page. You can uh, have today's highlights, required tasks, might do, uh, maintenance or recurring tasks, so like weekly tasks, uh, what are your active projects, uh, and then an idea pipeline. So any idea that comes pops into your head, you can jot it down there. Um, notice that this is different from your uh, work breakdown structure or your project detail. So your to-do list is not the same as your project uh, uh, breakdown, the steps in your project. Uh, that is on should be on a separate page in your notebook. So what are the different steps in your project? Uh, like we saw in the Kanban sheet in Trello, so you have all the steps listed there. That is not a to-do list. That is your work breakdown structure for the project. Um, so a to-do list is, is different and um, it does not replace your detailed uh, breakdown of the project. Should also have a calendar. Um, use an electronic calendar with advanced reminders. Put all your deadlines and document renewals such as driving license renewal, et cetera, on it so you get a reminder. Uh, you don't have to remember it in your head. Uh, also use checklists. Checklists are like multi-step procedures. So for example, in your lab, uh, you do, uh, if you do a certain task, you have to follow, follow a certain procedure like wash your hands, measure something. Uh, so um, those things, you do it on a regular basis, but uh, don't, uh, you don't have to uh, remember it or memorize it. You can create a checklist. This is again separate from a to-do list um, and um, you should write it down on a separate section in your to-do notebook. So some examples, uh, don't be vague and don't mix tasks in one list. Uh, write each task um, in detail. Uh, use the first, uh, for example, here's an example, write the first draft of the introduction section. Uh, use a suggested article as model. So this is one item in a to-do list. It's long, it's descriptive. Um, the thing is, it, you don't have to think when you sit down. If you just write, uh, write theses, um, then you have to restart your brain and think what, you, what are the steps you have to do. So if you figured it out in advance and you've written it in your to-do list, then as you sit down, you know, you get a head start and uh, you can, uh, work on it right away instead of just thinking and recalling, okay, what do I need to do? Um, 
another example, go to purchasing department and ask about something. Uh, another example is choose a journal from Scopus. Um, so again, very descriptive tasks. Um, don't just write the uh, find journal. Um, so another example is what you know what do you actually have to do. Um, and then you can abbreviate things. So for example, I use the letter E for email, uh, the letter W to write, uh, the letter I for internet search, uh, the letter T for talking, and the letter C for a telephone call. Um, and then uh, finally, you also want to add the context. So you can use the at symbol so you can batch or you know separate your tasks that are done in a specific place. Uh, so you you know if you go to your lab, you're you're not thinking okay what are what are the lab tasks? You have it labeled and tagged already. Um, similarly, like shopping, you don't want to uh, go to shopping and then have your uh, notebook in the lab. Um, ideally, your shopping list should be on your smartphone. So some words about uh, traditional workflow. Um, uh, a lot of people rely on email, email attachment, or WhatsApp messaging, meetings, interruptions, and Word documents and Excel files. Um, these are now considered uh, disruptive and not the most productive way to do projects. Better way is to use uh, what's called information management or knowledge management, in which you have a single source of truth, a database with cloud files and shared knowledge. Uh, you, you have tags and categories or metadata for each file or each piece of knowledge. And you access control it so not everyone can access everything. And like, for example, you can give more access to your supervisor than to the lab assistant. Um, you have revision history if everybody's working on one uh, document, and then you have versioning. So you have uh, it's all done automatically by the information management software. And all this allows you to do uh, information reuse. So you can access information that is stored uh, for different purposes. Uh, this is the future and uh, hopefully we'll be moving away from Word documents and Excel files and more towards information management. Similarly, um, the traditional approaches to management in terms of project management, you know, the, from a traditional manager, you will hear words like accountability, responsibility, and performance review. Um, these are considered uh, inappropriate for the next generation of workers, uh, in which you know you are people are looking at other things beyond uh, doing the project in a structured way. So if you are managing uh, some subordinates, uh, uh, you want to you know, focus more on outcome driven goals, provide continuous help and guidance, share your knowledge and skills um, so that you, know, you are more in tune with the new uh, way of working. Um, another popular approach to project management is what's called agile approach. Um, and you know it has uh, what's called a manifesto or a guideline to uh, doing project management. Um, previously, uh, in contrast, you know you would specify everything in one big document called the requirements document, and then give it to the contractor, and they would complete it. And after six months, they would come with a product, and you know you have uh, often the product was not what you wanted, and it's caused a lot of problems and delays and uh, over budgeting. So in response to that, especially in software development, um, we have come to agile process. Um, some of you may will be familiar with this. And I've translated this to uh, um, the research project at the graduate student level. And maybe you know you can see some correlation what, the, what you can do to uh, implement an agile approach in your uh, research project. 
the focus here is on continuous productivity. So you're delivering something every day. Uh, you have frequent face-to-face -face meetings. Um, you don't rely on uh, monthly meetings uh, or status reports. One important um, working implementation of Agile is Sprint, um, sometimes called Scrum approach, uh, but Sprint is what uh, really embodies the Agile approach. And this is like a one to four week cycle of work. So each sprint, uh, you can think of sprint as a race or, or a run. And each sprint lasts for one to four weeks on which you won on one single uh, item or task. It starts with collaborative planning. And so you have the entire team thinking of what you want to do in the next sprint. Uh, so you have your supervisor, your lab staff, yourself, and you all come to a consensus on what is the priority and what should we do for the next two weeks. And that starts the uh, sprint, and um, it's usually a one to four week development cycle. Uh, you work on that one task only. You don't do any other meetings or other uh, things. And every day, every 24 hours, you do a daily stand-up meeting. So, you know, what was done yesterday, what will be done today, your supervisor will ask you, and then you discuss, you know, what, what you're going to do, what's your plan for today. Just, just might last for two, three minutes or five minutes. Um, you do it standing, it's not a proper meeting. Um, it's like a huddle. And at the end of the sprint, after two weeks, uh, you have a show and tell, uh, and you just show what you have done, you, what you have accomplished, and then your supervisor can comment whether this was uh, what met expectations or what could be done differently. And then you, um, you just plan for the next sprint. So how can we do this in a graduate uh, research environment? Um, you, know, you would meet with your faculty supervisor uh, to talk about the next sprint, specify what you will work for the next two weeks. Uh, every day you meet with a supervisor, what was done yesterday, what will be done today. Um, and then you do, uh, at the end of the sprint, uh, a show and tell. Uh, you show what you have done and your supervisor indicates whether it meets expectations. And uh, you could do another next sprint, at, uh, start the next sprint. So um, it's um, one to four weeks is a typical sprint cycle. Some people recommend six weeks. Uh, some people recommend just one week. Okay, so uh, the second last slide, this is the last content slide. The last the next slide is just the summary. Um, so we come to the final uh, issue, which is human factors. Uh, you know, uh, we're all humans with our own um, strengths, weaknesses, desires, family problems, issues. And if you're working in a team, you cannot ignore human factors. Uh, even if you have the best Gantt chart and work breakdown structure, it's not enough. You need uh, people skills. You need to be able to motivate people who are in your research project. Uh, when you do not have any authority to hire or fire them. So it is critical because your project success depends on your ability to meet. And um, there's a lot of literature on it. Um, let me share some tips. Uh, uh, you should hold one-to-one -one, uh, meetings with your uh, team members regularly, maybe on a daily basis. Uh, not like a group meeting, but just a chit chat on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, determine what the issues are, ask them for ideas, you know, give them a voice in the project, and then take their input seriously and act on it. Don't just ignore it. Uh, ask your team members what uh, they want to be when they grow up. Uh, ask them about their career aspirations. Uh, be a mentor, uh, and, you know, you can help them out. And this will really motivate them and, uh, you know, uh, have them on your side. Uh, be open, open and honest, uh, provide feedback in private on a regular basis, not just at the annual review. Uh, focus your feedback on the behavior, not on the person, so on what, what you saw. 
and finally connect with your team members at a personal individual levels at a, you know, by their first name uh, in a friendly environment in which you are supportive and helping them uh, sharing your skills and knowledge um, so that uh, you know they they develop a trust in you so that in a sense is some uh, of the human factors in uh, project management um, I will stop now. Uh, this is a summary slide. You know, we talked about tools and techniques used in project management, like the work breakdown structure, the Gantt chart, the Kanban board, um, agile approach, and sprints. Um, we talked about some tips to use your research to make sure that your research projects uh, run smoothly, such as the notebook. Um, you know, working early on your theses and showing your output on a regular basis. Uh, some pitfalls to avoid uh, uh, project failure, such as an informal attitude, uh, not reading extensively, not having a clear research question. And then finally, we talked about human factors in research and man uh, project management, uh, such as uh, sharing knowledge, listening to team members, showing appreciation, and providing regular feedback. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to stop and thank you for your attention. As always, it's, it's a pleasure to interact with our graduate students. Um, I wish you the best in your research projects, and uh, I hope you found this helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me. I'm using a new mic. Can Doctor, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, we appreciate your effort. Uh, students, if you have any question for Dr. Jawad, you can raise your hand. I will yes. unmute you and you can go ahead with your question. And uh, the second thing, I will resend you the feedback link. Uh, kindly fill in the feedback. Anyone with question, kindly raise your hand and I will unmute you, please. Or you can type it in the message box. Yes, you can also type it in the chat box as well. Doctor will see it. Yes, the workshop is being recorded and we will put it uh, on our YouTube. Uh, if, if there is no question, uh, we will just like to thank doctor for his time and his uh clear and uh, clear court workshop i think all of us really will learn a lot from it but please before you leave kindly fill in the feedback and those who came late please provide us with your name and your student id for record purpose
Uh, like this, the YouTube link is provided for you. It's like the CJS underscore UAEU. Once you go there, you will see all the videos, the works of videos that we are doing in the semester. Uh, if there is no question, uh, I guess we will end uh, the workshop. Doctor, do you have anything okay. to add on? Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, always uh, very nice to see all our students and uh, hope to do a, a, a workshop hopefully face to face in the future after COVID. So yeah, stay safe you. and stay healthy. And goodbye from me. Right. Thank you so much, Doctor. All right, bye bye.